have a test for you guys today. Oh, you're very excited about this. It's a reading test. Some of you might be able to read it. It's okay if you can't. But I'm pretty sure some of you will know it. Now, here's the deal though. Take a look at what I'm going to show you quietly. And if you can tell me what the word is, I want you to put your finger on your nose, but don't say anything. Okay? You ready? Okay, here we go. Put your finger on your nose if you know the word. Oh, oh most of you too. Okay. So, what do you think it spells? Mom, wow, you're smarty pants. <laughs> you're right, it spells mom. M-O-M -M spells mom. But are you sure that's what it really says? Are you sure? So we're going to change perspective. I want all of you guys to stand on your heads. Just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't do it. <laughs> we're going to change the direction of the paper. Are you ready? Wow. <gasps> <laughs> wow. Now what does it say? It says, wow, you're right. And wow is a good word to describe it too because just by turning the paper in a different direction, we have a whole different word. It's the same paper, right? Yeah, but we're just seeing it in a whole new way. So something similar happens in this week's gospel lesson. A few of the disciples were walking with Jesus way up high in a mountain when all of a sudden they saw him in a new light, in a new way. His clothes became dazzling white, as, as bright as lightning. Yeah. And they hear the voice of God saying that this is my son. There's a special name for this in the Bible. I wonder if you guys can say it with me. It's called transfiguration. Can you say that? Transfiguration. Yeah, that's a tricky one. When something is transfigured, it changes the way that it looks or it's transformed. We could say that caterpillars are transformed into butterflies, right, into butterflies. Their appearance changes and they become something new. So, but in the story, Jesus doesn't change his shape, but just like with our mom sign, suddenly the disciples are able to see him in a whole new way as the Son of God. It's a very exciting moment that changes everything for them. Can we pray? All right, let's do it. Ooh. I love it. Thank you. Dear God, we thank you for revealing your Son, Jesus, to us. Help us to live in his example this week. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. All right. Eternal God, there are many things in your word that it is very hard for human minds to take in and understand. Unless your Holy Spirit guides us and illuminates your word for us, we can really miss your message. So shed light, your light, deep in our spirits and in our minds, and help us understand. In Christ we pray. Amen. A woman sees a brilliant white light coming toward her as she lays seriously ill in a hospital bed and is near death. She hears the nurse beside her say that her vital signs are worsening. And as she hears that, she sees a brilliantly white light approaching her bed. And out of that light, she hears the words, you're going to be okay. It's not your time yet. And as the light recedes, she hears the nurse beside her say, her vitals are improving. The woman recovered and lived a number of years after that. It's a true story. I knew that woman well. Where do we get the belief that 
Christ can appear to us in a brilliant white light. I suppose one answer to that is that when Christ appears to us, he doesn't leave any doubt as to who it is. But we also find in the Bible strong support, not only for the possibility, but the actual reality of such experiences. The sermon text for today is Luke 17, 1 through 8. I'm going to read this passage in two sections. The first verses 1 through 3, and then I'm going to pause for a minute. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. How would you have responded in that moment? What would you say? What would you do? Listen to verses 4 through 8 and the way Peter responded. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> God bless you, Peter, for a wonderfully human response to such a mysterious and mystical experience. Wonderful, impulsive Peter. He tended not to spend a whole lot of time thinking before he spoke. Whatever came into his head tended to come out of his mouth very enthusiastically. We remember that just six days before, Jesus was gathered with his apostles and he asked them, who people said that he was. And Peter just blurted out, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Impulsivity can get you into trouble from time to time, but it reflects a kind of innocence and transparency that we see in young children. That's what makes our children's sermons so wonderful. You just never know what simple truth they're going to come up with. Blessed are the pure in heart, indeed. By the time Peter walked up that mountain with Jesus and James and John, he had grown accustomed to seeing Jesus' miracles. 
And the notion that Jesus could return Moses and Elijah to earth centuries after they had died was just not far-fetched at all. And as long as they were there, wouldn't it be great if they would just hang around for a while? I mean, wow. Imagine what it must have been like to be in the presence and hear Jesus and Elijah and Moses talking together. And not only they just, what it must have been like to have been there in the presence of all three of these men. Moses and Elijah were heroes in Judaism. They had been remembered and revered by the Jewish people down through the centuries. They were men in whom the Spirit of God was manifested in powerful ways that must have made them seem larger than life as they were remembered. And now, suddenly, Peter was seeing them for real. Though they had died centuries earlier, there they were, standing with Jesus in the presence of Peter, James, and John. It must have seemed like the greatest blessing to be in the presence of all three men, all at the same time. No wonder Peter thought it would be a good idea to build three little tent-like temporary shelters Maybe they'd hang around for a while. The problem with that line of thinking is that it totally missed the point of the transfiguration. It missed the message that Jesus wanted Peter, James, and John to get as they walked up that mountain. And more importantly, it missed the message God the Father needed them to get before they would begin their apostolic ministry after Jesus had gone back into heaven. Given that we also are called to the same apostolic mission, we need to get the message of the transfiguration just as much as Peter, James, and John did. So what is the message? What is the message of that mystical experience in which Peter, James, and John were taken up into the Spirit of God? That bright cloud that engulfed them was a manifestation of God. And out of that cloud in which they were completely enveloped, God spoke to them. God was not some distant intellectual concept of divinity. God was right there and had taken them into himself. All the things that we think are so important, including ourselves, just melt away in such experiences. God is all in all. Part of the message that Peter, James, and John got that day was that they were in the presence of God the Father. God comes to us not just in material human form as he did in Jesus. God comes to us in non-material forms as well seen or unseen, called or not called, God is present. God is always nearby and manifests 
suddenly and powerfully in ways that evoke awe and humility. But God had more to impart that day by way of Jesus' transfiguration. In the account of this event in the Gospel of John, we are told that Moses and Elijah talked with Jesus about his departure from earth, which was soon to happen. Was that maybe the message? No, emphasizing that message seems to miss the message that God wanted Peter, James, and John to get. Surely, God had already communicated directly with Jesus that his time on earth was coming to an end. Another message that can easily be heard in the Transfiguration is the same that was heard at Jesus' baptism. When God made Jesus aware and everybody else, you are my son, and you I am well pleased. But given the temptations of Satan that Jesus had already rebuked, and given all of the trials and tests of the Pharisees that Jesus had already overcome, it seems pretty likely that we can faithfully conclude Jesus already knew he was the Son of God. And Peter had already confessed, you are the Son of God in the presence of the apostles. So there's still more to the transfiguration message than that. The transfiguration was surely for the purpose of Peter, James, and John, and us. Its message was given to them directly by God, both inwardly and outwardly, so there was no chance that they could miss the point. God spoke what he needed these three men and us to know, this is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but he is the son of God, and he is forever preeminent over Moses, Elijah, and all the other prophets. Jesus was not being added to a pantheon of Jewish prophets. He was different from them. It is as if God was saying, let there be no doubt in your mind that Jesus is my son, and you are to listen now to what he says. The time was coming when they would enter into despair, and God was making sure that they knew beyond any doubt that this really is the Son of God. Someone recently put it this way, do not doubt in the dark what God told you in the light. Never doubt when you are in darkness what God has told you in the light. Life with God was about to change for God's people. And Jesus was the link between the previous way they had lived with and experienced God and what was to become the new way. A new 
relationship was to be experienced. God was doing a new thing, and Peter, James, and John were going to be God's helpers in bringing that message to God's people. The time was coming when they would take God's message to all nations of the world. They would take the message of the new covenant sealed in Jesus' blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. It was not just the message of reconciliation that they would be taking. They were taking that new relationship, a closer, deeper relationship between God and God's people. God would make the truth of God's reality just as the divinity of Jesus was a reality. The reality of God would become just as real as the flesh and blood Son of God who walked this earth. God would be present with people, just as God was present in that cloud with Peter, James, and John. The law of Moses and the prophecies of Elijah were not dead. Rather, they were fulfilled in Jesus and given a new meaning. The meaning Peter initially took from the Transfiguration was not the right one. And that fact begs the question as to whether the first meaning we take from the Transfiguration is the right one. Jesus' Transfiguration is recorded in Scripture not as an interesting historical anecdote, but as an event that has deep meaning for us. Just as the event led to change in Peter, James, and John before they would carry out their apostolic mission, there needs to be a change in us that enables us to carry out that apostolic mission for God successfully. Who is Jesus for us? Who is Jesus for us? We are accustomed to figuring that out by reading the Bible and studying Scripture to gain knowledge of who Jesus was and is, that gives us head knowledge. But it does not help us know Jesus in that deeply spiritual sense, deep inside our spirits, where we don't just know about God or know about Jesus, but we know them. Peter, James, and John had shared life with Jesus for three years, and all they had learned throughout that entire time paled in comparison to what they learned that day atop that mountain when Jesus was transfigured before them 
and God enveloped them in a bright cloud and spoke to them. If God knew they needed God to reveal to them the reality of Jesus' divinity and God's presence with them, surely we need God to reveal to us not just the idea, not just all the historical events, not just all of the truths in Scripture. Surely we need God to reveal to us that reality as well. Whether God does that by a mysterious, mystical experience or by revealing it inwardly in our spirits. Our relationship with our Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit also needs to advance to the next level. And there is always a next level where God is concerned. Let our Lenten prayer be that God will enable us to experience the reality of God's presence here with us and out there with us and every place we go. Amen.